digital infrastructure from data centers, fiber, uh, towers. Thank you. My name is Maya Hernandez. I'm the director of Green Financial Systems at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I have to take a breather for that name. Um, we are a multilateral development bank, so our mandate is to foster transition and development. We invest in Eastern Europe, around the Mediterranean, Turkey, Northern Africa, Central Asia, um, very broadly quite a diverse region. And um, digitization and green uh, or sustainable investing are two of our three strategic priorities, so this is a good nexus for us. Um, and of course, as a development bank, traditionally we invest heavily in infrastructure, traditional infrastructure, and now, of course, um, we invest pretty much in all sectors, except those that we have excluded by, um, by emitting sectors. Hey, um, my name is Charlie Evans. So if I haven't made it before, I work for Green Hill. I'm vice president of the digital infrastructure team at Green Hill. Um, and although I tell some of my dinner party guests that Green Hill is an environmental consultancy, it's actually an investment bank. Um, so we, it sounds more like an environmental consultancy. Um, so we advise uh, infrastructure funds, but also corporates on buying and selling companies or raising capital in the digital infrastructure space. And I spent a lot of my time on the data center sector. Um, and yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here and share perspectives on how we see investors treating the sustainability subjects when they're making investment decisions. Very cool. Why don't we kick it off with the, with the title of the panel, which is Climate Capital. Um, and the question I would like to ask is, you know, is it something specialized? Is there climate capital? Or from your perspective and where you do, is sustainability and uh, climate focus just part of your everyday activities? And maybe I will start with Maya, who has the broadest perspective in the panel. Sure, I would say it's a bit of both. Um, so we have, of course, an environmental social policy that is integrated in every single investment that we do. So there is sort of a minimum condition. Um, our mandate from the founding papers 30 years ago says that we're only to invest in uh, environmentally and socially sound uh, economic activity. So there's sort of a minimum condition to comply with environmental social um, standards, international best practice. Um, but then that's sort of the minimum requirement. And then the second piece, I think, of this puzzle is really the dedicated climate action. So in our case, we've set ourselves a target to be um, a majority green bank by 2025. That would mean 50% of our new approvals will be dedicated to climate-friendly uh, financing. And um, yeah, we're, we're pretty much there. So we've reached the 50% last year. Now it's going to be a challenge to maintain them until 2025. It's not that easy. Um, but yeah, I would say it's a bit of both. Um, we need to make sure that any financing that goes in any sector that may not be per se green um, is sort of sustainable as much as possible. But then we're also uh, making resource allocation decisions. And there is where we can really make a differentiation and look at a potential investment, whether that's in a corporate or whether that's in a financial institution or in a fund. And we can say, look, OK, if we have our own targets, if maybe our partner has some targets for climate action, for sustainability, then we will prioritize that investment over a more traditional one. And these are um, resource allocation decisions that we make, and that we, so we actively seek out those investments that have a higher uh, climate um, positive impact. Great. Thank you. Charlie, when you advise on digital infrastructure, what's the approach to sustainability? So I can so I can pick up on that. Um, I think it's really Why interesting. Is that better? Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Um, so I think what you were saying about prioritizing sustainable investments is very interesting, and I think although maybe perhaps outside of the specialist sustainable investors, that's something that. We've definitely seen change over the past, course of the past three years, uh, maybe two, three years. There's a much greater prevalence of the sustainability discussions among sort of your normal profit-driven investors, um, and I think that's a question that these days most people are asking, and most people do have the okay, what's the what's the sustainability plan or sustainability story around this business when they go into an investment now, um, and I think so. I think that. Probably the investment universe, uh, as well as society, is generally on a transition towards 
taking sustainability more seriously and actually action supporting words. Um, and that's the first step. What I would say is often actually, um, and I'm making a sweeping generalization here, so inevitably someone will disagree with me. Often when you ask, when you have the sustainability discussion in, for example, acquiring a new company these days, it's quite, it, to be honest, it's quite a shallow discussion. Um, the discussion is had, but it's very difficult to underpin that with hard analysis today. Um, and as, so our job is advising people when, on valuation and kind of essentially whether it's a, whether buying this is a good, a good idea. And sustainability typically doesn't factor in kind of the, the top five or the top 10 list of items to discuss. And I would say if you go to maybe as, a, as an example, in an investment committee deck for infrastructure funds, typically I don't think there's a, st a slide on sustainability. Um, so, so that all sounds very pessimistic. I think ultimately my, my perspective of the big picture is things have changed hugely in the last three years in terms of the attention paid sustainability. But we're not there yet because it's so difficult to, to know what a sustainable investment is. Um, and to know and to kind of set those targets and know which businesses will help you meet those targets and which businesses. Will. Um, but part of the part of the topic for discussion is profitability of those investments as well, isn't it? Um, and I think that I think that a, today a business that has a story around being sustainable attracts more attention from buyers, um, and therefore it probably is profitable in, from a valuation perspective to do that. However, I don't think we're yet at a stage where you can easily differentiate A, which is really making a positive contribution, from B, which has a good story around it. Um, so I don't know if that, I don't know if that's... I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot to unpack there. Too but, pessimistic? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm actually, I, I'm personally less pessimistic on the equity side, and kind of I can share our perspective separately, but I'm a bit skeptical on the debt side, Michael. You know, what, what I'm hearing is basically, oh, we've got this ESG facility, and we tie it to, you know, whatever KPIs are, the benefits is five-fifths on the margin. And then the world where interest rates go where they are, I think that probably doesn't make a difference to the company. So how, you know, how, how do you approach it from the financing side? No, that's a fair point. And um, I mean, like we've heard already this morning, and as, as Maya mentioned clearly, a lot of banks and credit funds, I think almost everyone probably has as an, as an ESG policy, ESG framework, we have our own uh, sustainable finance framework, um, which I agree with you. I think one, essentially it means on our side, it means uh, two things. Um, uh, for a transaction to be sustainable, it's either the use of proceeds. So if you do a renewable energy financing, that's a tick the box. If you do an energy efficient uh, data center, that's tick the box. Um, if you can't tick those boxes, so use of proceeds or, or uh, profile of the corporates, so, more than I think 90% of revenues being uh, being sort of uh, sustainable energy efficient revenues. Then indeed the second second way to get an, an ESG or sustainable um, compliant financing is is having ESG KPIs. And um, we've heard some of the numbers this morning. I mean there have been billions and billions of these type of financings. And I agree with you on a lot of them. The KPIs probably weren't overly overly um, uh, challenging, demanding, um, uh, really to me. And the margin moved by two and a half, five basis points or so. I think we've seen um, we've seen a change a bit again over the last sort of six six months or so that a people focus a lot more on the on the KPIs and make sure they are really demanding, get them independently audited. And we've heard some of the challenges um, this morning on what that means for for data centers, for example, where clearly PUE has always been used, but uh, isn't isn't really the only obvious candidate here for, for a KPI. Um, you need to look at the S and the G as well, so whether it's housing safety or governance or female representation and all other things that are frequently used. Um, but it's, uh, and I think also on the, on the, on the margin link, we, we do see, I think we've seen uh, swings of 15 basis points or more, which again, the currently rising rates environment isn't, isn't massive, but it's sort of moving in the right direction. Um, but I think probably even more importantly, it will drive uh, capital allocation as well. So I, I know it for us internally, when it is ESG, it, it, in terms of capital availability, possibly return requirements, possibly cost of funds, I think they're all linked to, link to that, uh, and sort of the ESG targets that the bank has. And so I think that will probably drive it more over the next two years than 
yes, a 5, 10, 15, 20 basis points move in the margin. So whether you can even do a project or not, as we have seen on the sort of criteria on the, on the extreme side on, on cold financings, which a lot of people don't, don't really touch. Good. So looks like we are at the start of the way, right? Moving in the right direction, maybe not quite there. Now, you know, the change in the tech uh, as well a little bit and expanding the you know digital infra climate, looking where they're overlaid. So, and you, you, you said digital overlay, so enlighten us. What, yeah. What's that? Um, firstly, I think it's quite interesting. I think I'm almost at the opposite end of um, uh, uh, Charlie. When we look at investments, every single investment has to go through full ESG screening, um, climate and otherwise, and we believe that it's fundamentally tied to the financial outcomes of that investment. That may be um, in the future, it might be on water, it might be because you are tripping up local communities by the drawer of a data center on an energy grid, um, and therefore you're in place to some of these or, or interconnection um, delays or, or other issues. Um, so for us, fundamentally, ESG has to be a climate has to be part of every investment. Um, so when we look at the digital overlay, um, which is, is, is part of the area that, that you're asking about, what we look for is, okay, where are the opportunities um, that we can provide benefit, particularly to energy markets. Um, it could be energy markets, uh, it could be to digital infrastructure itself, or the role that digital infrastructure has in its communities. We all know that they're one of the biggest um, and increasingly one of the biggest energy users um, in the world and will continue to grow. And so, what are the roles that digital infrastructure has to play in order to support the energy markets and the communities in which it's located? What is obligation? Um, to be able to feedback. So some of that is how we're actually managing, how we're managing and coordinating um, the energy supplies. So when it comes to your backup supply, um, what are you doing in a data center that enables the, the effective coordination, um, dispatch storage, um, the, the, all that infrastructure? Um, and what we focus on a lot are the missing gaps. Yes, you can build renewables, you can build storage, but getting that to work in an energy market requires a whole overlay um, of digital, uh, I guess, technology companies that are focused on calling that dispatch. What's the weather going to do tomorrow? How are you forecasting that um, to enable you to figure out what's the most effective thing for me to do with my storage that I have inside today? Or, you know, am I going to keep my backup or what am I going to do with it to the extent that the storage works back up, which it isn't until it's not there yet. Um, but it's those types of things that we really focus on. So what are the gaps that are missing in the market that we need to fill to actually find solutions um, for, for digital infrastructure? Very interesting. Now, in, you know, moving without a digital tool, and you you you've got the uh, my, my, sorry, you you've got the broad remit, right? So, how do you use? How do you see the use of digital infrastructure tools to achieve sustainability goals for your investments in other sectors? Um, there's definitely a big role to play for for digital generally. Now, uh, we have a problem in the ESG. Uh, world, so to speak, with data still. So digital solutions are extremely important. We have a challenge with traceability. Um, you, you're probably aware since the pandemic, but also for some other reasons, supply chain issues have become very, very front of our uh, sort of common uh, awareness. Um, so um, supply chain issues and traceability is a huge topic for us. Um, we look at the pandemic showed us suddenly, you know, classical infrastructure investments. We couldn't go on site anymore and do our usual due diligence, uh, ESG due diligence. So we had to start looking at digital um, alternatives, geospatial data, and, and uh, other types of alternative data to actually grasp um, the ESG side of our potential investments. So I think there's a huge role to play for, for digital in, in general to really drive that drive that forward and, and get us to a place where we have better data, better transparency. Um, I also, um, just going back to the profitability question, I, I also disagree a little bit with the pessimistic view that was shared in the beginning because uh, what we've seen, and anecdotal evidence from, uh, in my case, working on those projects for about 20 years now almost, uh, is, is massive. That getting ESG right is really insurance. It's, it's really part of our risk management. Um, often environmental and social risks are referred to as non-financial risks, which is for me one of the most useless terms ever um, because they translate very directly into financial risks. And I've seen massive projects go 
uh, really down the drain just because they, you know, the company lost the, lo the social license to operate or because, you know, a perfectly green project like a wind farm suddenly, you know, uh, was found to have very adverse impacts on biodiversity and then, you know, they couldn't sustain the financial models any further. So it, it is really important. It is um, definitely an absolute integral part in our case for any, any investment decision. So the environmental social sign-off is just as heavy as or as needed in the invest, at the investment committee as is the credit risk management sign-off or the compliance, the legal, or whichever else sign-off. So I think it is it's become a completely integral part. But yes, I have a big ho I have big hopes for the um, further digitalization. Um, it also helps us communicate with our clients. So for example, we've created a digital app that our clients can use to collate and collect their environmental social performance data, interpret it, and then um, really derive good um, environmental social action plans, conclusions from it. So um, I think there is a big opportunity for the, for the digital business uh, community to, to look into ESG. Great. So, look, I, I think I, I personally am a big believer that in, in, in that room with the with the digital infrastructure operations and the, the digital infrastructure investments we can <coughs> Uh, on, on those climate goals, and we can do that profitably. And um, if we turn the time to the digital infrastructure assets themselves, then probably data centers are the one which are the most obvious candidate to uh, challenge the environmental footprint. And you know, I would start on, on our side. We made an investment in, in the Nordic data centers, and frankly, if if I were to summarize it in in, in one sentence, it's green and cheap. So yes, you know we are green by being in Iceland and Sweden, and we can provide cost-efficient total cost of ownership solution to, to our clients. So that works. It's a niche, nevertheless. So I don't know, Charlie, can we expand the niche? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and not be so pessimistic this time. Um, so I think Nordic data sense is a really interesting example. Uh, it's I think for me it's an example of how digital infrastructure and data sense are a sector which are they're driven from both sides to be sustainable. So on the one hand, you have investors, and we all know what the investment um, kind of sustainability drive is like. But you also have customers who are very politically exposed and who have um, sustainability goals themselves. And I think a lot of the driver, well, the driver, the driver coming from both sides means that investors are asking how sustainable the business is because they know that the commercial ramp up of a potential data center is heavily tied to whether a hyperscaler is willing to buy, to buy into the sustainability of the energy. Um, so I think that's one of the special things about our sector that means that actually, although data centers do consume a lot of energy, we're probably in one of the spaces where people are putting the most amount of emphasis um, and focus on making that as sustainable as possible. Um, the other interesting topic I think in in that particular space is you spend a lot of time talking about PUE. Um, I think everybody does, and that comes down to how much energy you're consuming, so it's important. Um, but I think that the discussion is becoming a little bit broader. Um, and I was speaking to some colleagues who uh, effectively reusing old brownfield sites. And, the qu and when you think about it, if you take traditional real estate, actually about 40, 50% of the carbon um, emissions of a building are putting the building in place in the first place rather than actually running the building day to day. So you might be better off retrofitting an old building in the long run and it being slightly less energy efficient um, than you are building a new one that's perfectly energy efficient. And I think that's a theme that as the edge develops, which requires a lot of smaller data centers which are naturally going to have lower PUEs, um, probably looking at the whole carbon journey from kind of from having a plot of land to having an operational data center is an argument to become quite relevant because um, players like Atlas Edge are gonna start, are gonna argue that theirs is the greenest model because although their PUE is higher, uh, they're not emitting carbon to build the new data center in the first place. That's, uh, I think that's definitely an interesting perspective. Uh, and I, I think your DC strategy is more US focused. So what, you know, what are the peculiarities there? Yeah, so it's, yes. Um, in Australia and the US, we also have a UK focus, but that um, has been as far as the US and Australian strategy. And what is what we've done is we've looked at what the Nordics and Europe have done, and said, okay, 
what lessons have we learned and how does that actually apply or not apply in something like the US market? Um, and that, I think, is an incredibly interesting space. In the Nordics, obviously, you've got pretty much carbon-free energy, you've got great ambient temperature, probably got some biodiesel backup that you can burn to HBO or similar at some point. Um, and, and really, the focus is already a lot of building materials, but it's the, the last mile. Um, go across to the US, um, and there's still discussions about, okay, how do we even get the carbon-free grid piece itself, um, let alone getting that last mile of building building otherwise. Um, so I think that, that's that been a really interesting one, is learning from Europe and saying, what have we seen from a regulation perspective? Um, what have we seen from uh, from, a, from an energy perspective or climate perspective that we need to be really careful making sure that we're applying and watching out for in the US? Um, and to be blunt, it takes a lot more drive. If you're building data center in Texas, um, you don't have the ambient temperature of the way. You can't be into a greenhouse because bees die at 35 degrees or something, so you don't have greenhouses to, to kind of use excess energy. Um, and in fact, a huge amount of your focus is on the water. Um, where am I getting water from? Not just where am I allowed to get water from, but if this data center is still standing in 10 years and we've had a water stress event and increasing temperatures leading to increasing water stress events, what is my, what is my obligation to have mitigated that um, risk both to the community um, who's already drawing on, on those activities or otherwise. So if, if you've got a farming community and you're taking the water that they could otherwise have, what are your obligations to actually come up with a different scenario and a different solution to that? Um, so that's where we spend a lot of our focus is on looking at that and saying, okay, what else can we do, be doing and what do we need to be future proofing for to help our tenants not be at risk of significant increases in cost in two, three, four, five years time or six months time as regulations start to, to keep up with the industry. Um, so that's, that's uh, really what we're doing and we are you know, having you know, led the way um, in a lot of ways um, so that we can get a good idea of some things that can happen um, and, and really try and get it and, and bring that into another market. So maybe to you know put, put the final touches on, on the whole challenges topic and, and we've spoken about it, climate, uh, you know, relevance of, of, of the KPIs, gathering of data. Uh, Michael, anything else which stands in the way of uh, being impactful in, in terms of the climate campus? Yes, maybe picking up one point that, um, that Charlie and I mentioned is on the sort of data centers, and I think one challenge we, we see at the moment, I mean, we have financed um, two of the large platforms in, in the Nordics as well for, for exactly the same reasons. It's, it's Nordic, it's, it's cheap and uh, renewable um, uh, energy. I think what will become more a topic because we are financing data centers throughout Europe is sort of the whole security of supply, uh, repower EU topic with rising, uh, rising power prices and how that might impact some of the uh, some of the data center operators and some of the um, sort of end customers into uh, choice of locations, whether it's still in Germany or other markets that they might move to. Um, I think one of the one of the other challenge I would I would probably add there is is the whole topic on regulations. Um, and that's regulation clearly for our for our clients for the operators, and we've heard about some of that this morning. Um, but then it's also regulation for for banks for investors on um, clearly the whole ESG targets that is driven by banks, investors believing in it, but it's a lot also driven by um, the European Banking Authority or other central banks or other, other uh, regulators here providing uh, guidelines, um, uh, degrees, etc. Um, and I think a lot of that, so that's one, for example, is the green asset ratio that banks will be required to report from, I think, end of this year uh, to next year onwards, so what portion of, uh, of the, of the uh, of our banking book loans are sort of green or sustainable. And so that will require us to have that information, that data from our clients, from our customers, um, to put it into finance documentation to really standardize that, uh, that whole sort of reporting mechanism where we are at a very early stage at this, uh, at this time. And I, I think a lot of standardization across, across countries, across regions, and across institutions is still, still required for us and, and sort of the industry to meet uh, those targets. Thank you. Maya, you spoke about the need for digital solutions for you to deliver on your sustainability goal. Do you find it easy to find those solutions, to get them scaled, to use them? Um, I guess, well, what, one thing is sort of the practical solutions for doing our work as ESG professionals. Um, there's a lot out there. 
Um, I think the challenge that we're facing in general in the climate capital sphere is that as an investor, we need to find bankable projects. And sometimes when a project is very innovative, that's fantastic, but as a bank, we find it hard to identify what the risks are. You know, we struggle um, with technologies that we don't know. So um, this is sometimes one of the hurdles in climate finance and generally, which is why we work a lot with what we call concessional finance or blended finance mechanisms, where we actually use um, some de-risking mechanisms using public money and then trying to leverage as much as possible private money into the into the deal so that we can have you know um, a project bring it to bankability where perhaps a commercial lender alone would not yet quite feel comfortable to go into. Um, I think this is this is um, in a, this is why or this is this describes one of the problems why the climate finance is not yet flowing at the scale and at the speed that we needed to really comply at least with the um, goals that we've been, we've, we've been given ourselves as a global community through the Paris Agreement um, and the 2050 net zero pledges. So this is, I think, something where we need to, to work. We, we see often, um, you know, in this, especially in the digital and the startup sphere, a lot of companies that come up with great ideas. and. Um, there is still sometimes this gap of really making those projects bankable. So I think this is an important piece. Um, but we can learn again here from, I think, the more traditional infrastructure projects where, or renewable energy generation, where we did the first big large-scale CSP projects, for example, back in the day, they used quite small amounts of public money to get it going. And then you, know, they, you, you generate a demonstration effect and you generate um, sort of comfort within the financial institutions to, to, to be able to um, measure those risks and then be comfortable to finance it. Understood. Charlie, is, is there enough capital? I mean, presumably if it's green and cheap, you don't have a problem finding buyers, but is it the right focus? <laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, digital infrastructure in general, there's a lot, there's a lot of capital. Um, I think the, one of the challenges is that how, how do you steer that capital to selecting and attributing value to sustainability? Um, and I guess, alluding to what Michael was saying about how it works at Deutsche Bank, I guess the, the, the end goal, the ideal structure is people at the source of the capital chain, so limited partners, public shareholders, um, can set a, a strict target for their asset management. You know, I want you to meet this, I want you to meet this level of regulation, and then the asset manager knows how that's measured imposes that measurement on their public companies and can measure on their portfolio companies and can measure what their overall portfolio is in terms of meeting different sustainability standards. I think at the moment, probably the, first of all, the information isn't available at the ground level, and then not everybody is aligned on what the different standards should be, so it's difficult to do that, and that's the challenge that Michael was alluding to. Um, but what, so what does that mean from an investment perspective and when you are buying a company or making investment decisions? I mean, I think, would you, I mean, this is a question rather than an answer, is there a world where, you know, five, ten years time, you're running a sustainability due diligence work stream when you buy a company, at the same way as you would run a financial due diligence work stream? Yes, legal we're doing it work stream. already, <laughs> not yeah. five years. Because <laughs> to be honest, I think it's, I think internally, it sounds like it's happening, but I don't think the ecosystem of professionals where you can, where someone like Dimitri can go and hire a, uh, Deloitte or equivalent to do a sustainability analysis, understand what investments need to be made in order to meet their targets, necessarily is as mature or mature enough to for sustainability to be kind of at par with the other key due diligence questions and investment. I think the, 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 the one of the key challenges is really the question of prioritization. So it's, you know, it's, it's very exciting and to be honest it was kind of a bit of a leading question at the beginning. Do we need specialty solutions for climate, and my belief is not. My belief is that there is a bit too much hype when it comes to whatever, you know, doing the next hydrogen, the next fuel cell, the next something else, versus looking at your traditional businesses at scale and achieving decarbonization at scale. And uh, clearly for that, digital is pretty important. Mark? Just, just picking up on your point, Byron, and also Charlie, are there any metrics out there that uh, a sort of commonly held standards of measuring sustainability? Because we talk about this a lot, 
and obviously sat on the edge of that due diligence process being illegal. Um, you know that those sustainability assessments are ongoing. But I'm not sure that I see any standards where somebody says, well, it, you know, it's this sustainable on this particular aspect of the business. It means something to other businesses. Yeah, we throw it to Anne because that was one of the questions oh, I had and I didn't get to ask. So <laughs> Um, I should preface this by saying we have an Article 9 fund for anyone who knows the joys of Article 9, um, which effectively, uh, what the EU has done um, is that they have attempted to do exactly what you're asking for, is to come up with, get rid of the glossy pictures and the greenwashing and everything else, and come up with uh, a black and white, very clear means <coughs> of assessing various um, parts of sustainability. Um, and it's a regulation where anyone who is uh, marketing a fund to European investors, um, if they are claiming to have any sort of sustainability or climate uh, kind of um, benefits or impacts, they have to report under this very specific, um, I guess, guidance to all their investors each year. What it does is it means that um, you are suddenly reporting on a very strict set of measurements and calculations. There's no real room. If, for example, if you're reporting on, let's say, DEI, uh, diversity project, that's the easiest one. Um, there is no real room to say, oh, we're going to pull our VPs, senior directors, because then we can put a few more women in. It is simply how much are you paying people who identify as women, how much are you paying people who identify as men. Divide that and we'll see what your answer is. Um, so, so they come up with. Um, something that a lot of people think is a massive headache and is in a way, but at the same time, um, from having run through it now a lot, it has been incredibly helpful in starting to even the playing field and get a more standardised. Now, there are always potential issues when you start to put things in single factors and, and single numbers and you can, you know, you can miss things. Um, but I think it's a great starting point. S&P and others have tried at various stages to come up with standard system. Bloomberg, they all have their own system trying to report on them. Um, and I admit, I haven't found any of them overly useful because it's often a dollar per you know, something per revenue metric or something per investment metric. And, um, and some of the other, some of the European ones are like that. Um, but I found these to definitely be the best step in the right direction. And what the EU doing, the UK is now going to be looking at doing um, the SEC is picking up on, on some of it, Hong Kong's picked on some, up on some of it. Um, so it's becoming a, a more globally, the ISSB, so the International Sustainability Standards Board, I might have got that wrong, um, sorry if I did. Um, but the ISSB, so uh, is, is trying to come up also with an accounting standard um, around ESG. So what we're seeing is ESG has really gone from, and climate has gone from, something's kind of nice to do and let's report some nice metrics about, you know, how many people we brought back from maternity leave or whatever it is. Um, to something that is, they are trying to get to the point where it's, um, I guess, a standardizes accounting to the extent you can, um, which is, you know, I think it's, it's definitely some um, incredibly helpful and positive steps. And then there's also, you know, people like us who have come up with um, true cost is, is one of the climate, so just sort of speaking about climate specifically, um, to try and get much more specific um, climate <coughs> metrics that you are assessing an asset on. So what are all the factors on a, on a climate aspect that you are assessing an asset and that risk on? Um, and the EU has actually adopted pretty much the, what the lot of the true cost is doing. Um, so they're increasingly are standards out there where people are working towards coming to something um, which is beneficial. And what the EU is doing is twofold. One is they're saying if you're making a claim about having an impact, you have to be able to back that up. You cannot market to any European investor, claim to have an impact, and then not actually have numbers and verification to back that up. Um, so they're kind of pushing out greenwashing that way, and at the same time trying to come up with a, a standardised thing. And it's going to change. They've come up with the climate piece, biodiversity, and other things are going to come in subsequent years. So it's going to be constantly evolving and changing. But I think it's um, actually as much of a headache as it is. There's everyone scrambling around, going, "How the heck do I do this?" Like TCFDs, like all the other reports that suddenly is being kind of thrown at everyone. I think the outcome is that it's going to make it easier, um, potentially, um, to, uh, to to kind of assess. And it's got some flaws. Elon Musk pointed out some of them. Um, I don't agree with everything, but he, you know, when you kind of criticise some of it, he had some other points. There are some flaws in it. Um, but uh, I think you know, we will slowly. Quickly. Quickly. You know, if, if, it's, if you can measure it, 
people are much more likely to behave in a way that achieves it. That's right. And if you have to report on a public thing, then you're going to start to see people going, oh, crap, I can't just put a headline out in the media saying this is what I'm doing. I have to report on that to the SEC. And we need to just distinguish here two things. Um, so first, there's the problem, which is we have a plethora of standards and frameworks out there right now. And what we need to achieve as a global community, I think, is merge them at some point. The EU is drawing in a lot of that. Uh, the EU legislation that you made reference to, the EU Sustainable Finance Framework, the SFDR, which is what you were talking about with Article 9. Um, however, there's two pieces of this. First, there are several frameworks out there for the management side of environmental and social sustainability risks. Things like the IFC performance standards or, or our performance requirements, they give really a good framework how to work your way through different topics from pollution, biodiversity, labor, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that allows you to manage them in a very categorized way and you can internalize those and then at least um, you may not be doing it in the same way as the next investor or the next company, but at least you have a rigorous way of going through the different applicable topics. And then what you were talking about, uh, and rightly so, is the reporting side. That's sort of the, the back end, of course, but it works currently a lot like, a bit like reverse engineering. Yeah, we see all this new regulation coming up on the reporting end, and that forces banks, forces corporations to put the house in order on the management side. Because in order to report properly, they obviously need to manage them first, identify the risks, and so on and so forth. So there is, yes, there are many, many standards out there. Some of them are better than others. Some are, some have become international best practice, and I think they're a good model to follow, such as the IFC performance standards, equator principles for infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's the reporting standards. But we need to merge them. We need to come to more of an agreement what, so that we all speak the same language. I think this is what we're still lacking. We've got probably 90 seconds to go, so any last question from the audience? Not, uh, do you guys want to give you know, 15 seconds on your ambition until 2030 in climate capital? Sure, so I think um, probably how little I know about how sustainability is measured is uh, reflective of how far we have to go in terms of that measurement. And I think I hope that in uh, five, ten years, uh, M&A bankers will be as knowledgeable about calculating how carbon um, efficient a business is as they are about calculating how much EBITDA a business is going to emit, because that's going to be important to investors, um, and it's something that we're going to have to become much smarter on. <coughs> Charlie, Yeah, and I guess I've kind of already said it. So we have the three components. We have, of course, our the safeguards that's already in place. We've committed to, as of January, all of our funding to be aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So Paris alignment is a big, big thing for us right now, um, as we're getting ready to make sure, as of January, all of the funding that leaves our doors is aligned with Paris. And then the, the third, the climate action point that I've mentioned is by 2025, 50% plus uh, of our new funding will be dedicated for climate positive projects. Thank you. Yeah, we have um, similar targets. Um, so we have, um, I think we have a 200 billion um, sustainable financing target. Originally it was 2025 that has been moved forward. So it's brought forward. So it's now, we expect to have achieved that by the end of the year. And I think it's now a 500 billion uh, euro target by, by 2025, arranging, investing, and, and lending uh, to sustainable uh, financing projects. So there are many other targets, but I think here it is. Um, for us, we're already 100% sort of climate aligned investor, um, so we get the fun part, which is um, filling all the gaps, as I said before, hard to decarbonize sectors, supporting um, digital infrastructure tenants in what's next, finding out the technology that's out there that is um, feasible or maybe feasible because it's a data set, obviously there's no risk that you take on um, as to whether it's operating or not. Um, so for us, there's a, you know, we get the really interesting part of, of investing in the genuine solutions um, for the hard to decarbonize sectors um, that we haven't managed to, to easily decarbonize yet. Great. Thanks a lot. Yes, that concludes the panel.